Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. This episode of Tourpreneur is sponsored by Ventrata. Ventrata is a proven and versatile booking platform built for high-volume tours and attractions. With contactless booking, payment, and check-in solutions, they can get your business back up and running quickly while keeping your staff and customers safe. For more, go to ventrata.com. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. On episode 131 of the Torpreneur Podcast, our guest gives us a perspective of running his tour company in a smaller market one that he says has been economically depressed for many years, but is now beginning to be revitalized. He also shares with us the perspective of starting a non-profit tour company and the benefits and drawbacks of non-profit versus for-profit models. This is Torpreneur, episode 131. And welcome to episode 131 of the Torpreneur Podcast. We're joined today by Mark Moscato of Buffalo Bike Tours. How are you, Mark? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. I got turned on to your show from Tour Operator in Toronto around episode number 20. And it's definitely been an inspiration, especially in this past year when it's been a pretty dark and uh, challenging time for tour operators. It really has. And thank you for your support. It means a great deal myself in terms of producing the podcast because i've shared before during the early days of covid i was unsure if i should still continue to produce the podcast i'm like well who wants to listen or who wants to share a story of look how great my business is and i'm not taking any tours out and i discovered the opposite their operators like no now is when we need to hear from other operators how they're coping how they're dealing and how they with the pandemic with your tour so buffalo bike tours i have to say i read this review on TripAdvisor, and i'd like to start with this if i may And the guest wrote, this tour is urgently needed for those who love Buffalo and wish to gain deeper understanding into the intersection of food and civil rights. Because this is the important thing for our listeners here is when you first got in touch, I'm like, oh, cool. He does a Buffalo wing tour. I'm thinking, yeah, who doesn't like Buffalo wings? Even my vegan friends like the Buffalo cauliflower wings, right? So of course we're all smiling. But then when I looked further into your tours and what you do, there is something far more deeper here than just, hey, go taste these wings. So how did that all come about? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I started Buffalo Bike Tours in 2018 and started doing a donation-based history tour called the B-Sides Ride, which is kind of like a social activist history tour. I got to say, when I was younger, I didn't really care for history growing up. And it was in my early 20s when I got involved with community activism. Uh, particularly an organization called the Buffalo Activist Network, where I began to see the connections between, you know, many of our, if you don't know anything about uh, Buffalo, we were once industrial powerhouse. We had more millionaires per capita than anywhere in the world. But unfortunately, by the 1950s, 60s, we're losing about half of our population. So much of our downtown is deserted and we are a Rust Belt town that's now just being kind of revitalized. But I started doing kind of like these history tours of Buffalo. And after a two or three hour tour, you know, the next logical question was, uh, where do we go get lunch? Where do we go get the best chicken wings in town? And so I never kind of set out to do a chicken wing tour, but it just kind of happened that in 2019, I introduced a chicken wing tour and taking people around to these different, you know, wing hotspots in Buffalo. It presented some different challenges. You know, if you've ever done a, a food tour, 
you know, chicken wings are kind of a complicated food. It's not like a croissant where you could just like cut it up and you're in and out. But chicken wings take time, right? Like 20 minutes, sometimes an hour. Wow, <laughs> as we really? found out on our tours. Wow. How come it's an hour on occasion? You know, many of the best chicken wing places in Buffalo are not necessarily like restaurants. They're more like dive bars. Right. Where you go after hours to go get the best wings in town. Not places that necessarily pride themselves on customer service. So arranging a food tour with three of those locations proved to be somewhat challenging at times. <laughs> but yeah, I guess as you were saying, like the more that I kind of like looked into the story, there's a very well-known establishment in Buffalo that claims to have invented chicken wings in 1964. The Anchor Bar, right? Yes, yes. Oh, I only know that because I watched your video. Add that in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so there are 30 locations. They're right. in Times Square. It's a big business now. There's a competing narrative where John Young, he had a chicken wing shop in Buffalo in 1961, three years prior. And then there's all these other kind of like other stories, like in Chinese cuisine, there's recipes going back to around the year 750. It's been a staple of Chinese cuisine. And there's some really interesting overlap between Asian and Black communities. And a lot of that is tied into the redlining, which is kind of like racist housing policy. And anyways, it made for a really interesting tour. And I reached out to the Young family, kind of uh, through happenstance, through a reporter at Channel 7, kind of connected with her family. And I was just like really open. I was like, you know, Lina, this story is really fascinating. How can I help tell this story? And so, you know, she mentioned that she still had actually her dad's recipe. And so... Well, anybody can get out their smartphone and like go to the Yanka Bar and find that. Our tour, the Wing Ride, is the only tour in Buffalo where you'll find the original Buffalo Wing, Mumbo Wings, dating back to 1961, that she makes only for our tour groups. So that's a really you know nice. special experience. And it's leading to other projects. We're actually partnering with the Young Family and some Black-led organizations on uh, creating a mural in honor of John Young. So just trying to bring his story to light. Through, you know, both kind of like a fun chicken wing tour, where we're just sampling kind of this whimsical food, but also um, getting into some of the more serious issues, the intersection of civil mm -hmm. rights and uh, our culinary traditions. So what's the response being like to your guests who are going on the tour and, and then learning all this social history as well? Yeah, I think it's been overwhelmingly positive. You know, the, the reviews, TripAdvisor have been great. You know, one of the top things I think that I've learned in my experience in running tours has been just being clear about expectations. There's been times because of some of the delays where we've only gone to like two locations or sometimes the itinerary will need to be adjusted for one reason or another. But just being kind of upfront and clear about expectations before we embark on the tour, or even just the fact that we are going through some, you know, kind of rough areas, setting that expectations, you know, it's in the copy on our website, we're going to be riding through some areas of disinvestment, but that's really important to kind of the story of the Buffalo Wing. Chicken wings were at one point routinely just thrown out, right? They were the lesser cut of meat. And for lower classes who didn't have access, monetary resources to purchase the better cuts of meat, they would be resourceful and use chicken necks, chicken wings, chicken thighs, and any other <laughs> part of the animal they could. So, you know, I've just kind of felt like compelled by some of the backstory to really kind of like reshape the tour from its first year where it was just about you know, a fun sampling of chicken wings to a more in-depth story, like you were saying, intersecting these various social issues. Yeah. Before COVID, who was your customer? Who was booking your tours? Where were they coming from? You know, when we first started almost entirely locals, I started out just, we have actually a pretty strong, passionate bike community. We have Slow Roll, which is about a thousand people on bikes every week, just raising the visibility of bikes. Uh, Ready Bike Share is the first social bicycle program in the United States that started here in Buffalo. So we have a really passionate bike community. So I just go to all the bike events in Buffalo and literally hand out dozens and dozens of handbills. And then getting those locals to leave reviews on TripAdvisor was really important to our growth. But as we became known to people outside of the area, our popular destination from people largely in Ontario, we're really close to Toronto, so it's less than two hours away. And of course, as soon as COVID hit, the border has been closed for the last year. So, you know, about half of the people on our tours last year were from Toronto. And obviously we had zero people from Canada this year. So, and that was another reason almost why to like, you know, really dig into some of the more minutia and the deeper uh, Buffalo story that if you ask any older black person in Buffalo, they are well familiar with the story of John Young's Wings and Things. 
But by and large, like the average person, like just walking down the street has never even heard the story. So yeah, I think the response has been great. And we try to kind of like saddle a meeting point between the person who's been a lifelong Buffalonian and those who have never been to the city at all. Sure. How have you been going about marketing to locals? I mean, obviously the the TripAdvisor reviews are important. How else have you been encouraging locals to come on your tours? Well, you know, this is kind of a labor of love. I do have a day job and you all got to pay the bills. Oh, yes. Also, as I mentioned uh, before, it's a very seasonal endeavor, Buffalo bike tours. If you know anything, Buffalo, we also are situated on Lake Erie. We have the lake effect snowstorms here. What is the season for you? Yeah, we start up in early May and we usually have a Halloween tour. Okay. Um, we didn't this year, so that's kind of the end of our season. Yeah. Yeah, early May to late October. Most busy, like most operators, June, July, August. September. Those are big months. But in terms of marketing, you know, working with Visit Buffalo Niagara, which is our visitor bureau here, they've done a lot to promote us. We don't have a ton of capital. So yeah. we've done some Facebook, we've done some Google AdWords campaigns, but a lot of it is kind of like blogs. I've tried to kind of teach myself SEO by just watching YouTube videos. We have a blog. I don't shouldn't say this out loud, but the other two operators in Buffalo don't have a blog. So that kind of gives us a little lag up on being discovered by out-of-towners. And then just like, I think those authentic relationships, you know, I really gone out of the way to go to primary sources and some of the historical research. So, you know, reaching out to the young family, I don't think many tour operators necessarily would go to those like extent and lengths that I did. Like I called literally everybody in the phone book I could find with the last name Young. I wrote people letters. I really kind of like went the extra mile, talked to community historians to finally track down down that family. But I've also reached out to a lot of community-based organizations. So, you know, we've done a tour around like gay history or black history in Buffalo. So reaching out to those organizations and say, you know, hey, we're putting this together. What should we be thinking about? Or how can we, you know, even going into it with an open, you know, not necessarily having an agenda, but saying, how can we work together to accomplish some of your aims and goals has been important to us just building it up from the ground up. You mentioned that you use some Facebook ads. How was that experience for you? Yeah, I have a friend who kind of is a guru. He makes a lot of money doing Google AdWords and digital marketing. And I don't have the first experience kind of with it, but I just say, Brian, like, can you set up this ad and here's a hundred (laughs) bucks? So I don't necessarily know. He assures me that the campaigns are working. And I have had people come on the tours and say, oh, I saw, you know, I saw the thing on Facebook or I saw the thing on Google AdWords and then, but, you know, I can't quantify it or put it into really our ROI. Yeah. 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 I think we all wish we had a Brian we could call up and help us out because it's uh... (laughs) Not easy, Facebook ads, but they are so effective, especially I'm hearing more and more from operators who are marketing to locals for locals who aren't aware that that particular tour or activity even exists. And then they're scrolling through Facebook, they see the ad. And of course, we need to do more episodes on this because it's not just an ad. It's the right image. It's the right copy. It's the right call to action. It's the right demographic. There's a lot that goes into it, but very, very effective when you're trying to get locals to book a tour. Yeah, I will say the one other thing that kind of comes to mind, just kind of in response to COVID and the local thing, um, we introduced a series of uh, five self-guided tours. Mm -hmm. That's been a topic that's been covered on your show is like, you know, kind of the digital virtual experience. We tried to make some of the, is interesting, just working in the space of bikes. Bikes are the thing that kind of blew up. I also, my other day job is I sell computers. So I, right. somehow I, like my phone was ringing off the hook as soon as COVID happened. <laughs> computers and bikes were the two things oh, yeah. that everyone needed. Yeah. But yeah, in response to kind of that, we put together a series of self-guided tours and we worked with a popular blog here, Step Out Buffalo. And I guest blogged on their website and we released a different ride each week for five weeks. That made a huge difference. We had eight or 900 people sign up for these tours that they would download on the Ride With GPS app. And that just built, you know, just our brand awareness. And those people are all part of our email list now. Some of those people have come back to do an in-person tour and they're just part of our constituents now. So we found that's a really valuable strategy. It doesn't replace the experience of actually coming on an in-person tour, but just augments it and gives, honestly, the people something constructive and useful to do while people are just kind of like going bored out of their mind and wanting to explore new places on their bicycle. And how did you build that app? Who did you partner up with? 
Yeah, so we didn't necessarily like build our own app. We just used Ride with GPS, which is a real time. It's kind of like Strava, if you're familiar with that, but yeah. it's very intuitive. You can design different routes. You can highlight different points of interest. We even have like narration and historical photos of different points of interest. Yeah, we used Ride with GPS. I've never used it. So for instance, do you record a narrative and then add that to the Ride with GPS app? Do you upload that somehow or? Yeah, you're able to, like, if you've ever used Google Maps, you're able to just put these points on the map and then kind of like drag the line where the good bike route is. So you want to avoid these certain roads. And I just know that from biking in the city. And then you're able to identify these points of interest. And then along the route, you can actually even program the navigation to like say different things. So there's, I try to interject actually some little bit of humor into it. There's some different quotes and yeah, so it was pretty intuitive, but yeah, we got some great response and, you know, a lot of people downloading the app and just, you know, was able to kind of just get the word out. And we also partnered with Niagara River Greenway, which is an organization that promotes bicycles and actually builds bike trails in Buffalo. So they helped us print like a little print piece that promotes it. So that's like available at the Visitor Bureau as well. So the things just kind of like all, you know, work hand in hand and it promotes our bike rental program. Yeah, just kind of like trying to leverage a couple of different things together. Yeah. You mentioned as well, working with Visit Buffalo. How did that come about? Because this is an area I hear a lot from operators, particularly operators who don't come from tourism. They get a bit nervous when they want to deal with the local bureau. They've been super supportive. I mean, they were a logical thing. We made the rack cards like every other tour operator. And But how did you know to do that? Because you're saying it. Like we just made rat cards. I mean, did you look at other rat cards? How did you go about that? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I pay attention. I mean, I go on all the other tours in town. I've been been on all of them. I think that's really important to see how other people do it and operate. But I kind of failed to mention I used to live in, I mean, I grew up here in Buffalo, but I went to graduate school in Portland and I, or in Eugene, and I moved to Portland and established a nonprofit organization there, Know Your City was executive director. So I had run tours in Portland for about seven years. So I worked extensively with Travel Portland and Travel Oregon. So I was well familiar with the idea of tours, you know, board and benefits, being friends with all those people could pay and inviting those people on your tours and just trying to figure out the ways, the points of intersection, how you could best work, you know, have them as an ally and have them in your back pocket. Like, you know, even applying for this grant to make the John Young mural, they, you know, I got them to write a letter of support to our arts council to say, we have this chicken wing trail that promotes chicken wings as a major destination in Buffalo. And we believe that adding this mural would, you know, significantly add to the story of the Buffalo wing and give another reason for people to visit. Yeah, it kind of came second nature because of my previous experience of running a tour operation in Portland. Are you looking to upgrade to a booking platform that will allow you to increase sales, distribute your product more efficiently, and reduce operating costs? Then you need to speak to Ventrata. Ventrata is a proven and versatile booking platform built for high-volume tours and attractions, and is trusted by Big Bus Tours, Historic Tours of America, RATP Group, City Sightseeing, and many more to power all their sales channels globally. They have a comprehensive platform that will allow you to manage and view live sales information from multiple channels in a single dashboard. Right now, Ventrata are offering a special pandemic recovery setup and payment plan to any business that books a demo before the 19th of March. For more, go to ventrata.com forward slash tourpreneur pre-COVID, because I also live on the border with Canada here in Vermont, so I haven't been able to go and get <laughs> good food in Montreal. I miss it. But how did you market to, to people in Toronto? How did they find out about your tours? Yeah, that is an area that I would like to improve. There's a couple of blogs, BlogTO, and a couple of weeklies there that people have recommended me taking ads out. We only have a couple of years under our belt, one of which was the COVID year. Yeah. So we haven't necessarily got to that point of growth, but I would like to consider maybe taking out some digital advertising or like pitching some of the, that was an idea to maybe invite some of the blog writers from Toronto to come. Um, we also get a fair amount of people from New York City as well. 
maybe pitching writers at the New York Times or, or whatnot to come to Buffalo and maybe even, you know, again, working with that Visit Buffalo Niagara to connect a writer up with hotel stay for free. That would just kind of like sweeten the deal for a writer to come to Buffalo, experience our tour, and maybe connect with a couple other different attractions. I've always found that in my experience of doing media and public relations, because I've done a bunch of event type of work, that I try to always put myself in the position of a writer and they get hit up with different requests to write about tourpreneur or whatever it may be. And it's hard to sell them on just writing about your particular thing. But if you can position your story within a larger narrative, like this is a phenomenon, Buffalo Wings. Yeah. Here are four different stories about how it all came to be. Or here are four different businesses or organizations that are leading revitalization efforts in Buffalo, building on Buffalo's waterfront or whatever that may be. If you can situate your story within the story of like perhaps other businesses or other tour operators, you just have a much greater story. It's more relevant and of interest to a writer or an audience. A good example of this actually is I'm very grateful now we're going into our third year of Tourpreneur that I get a lot of operators who write to me to come on the show and I'm grateful and very honored. But obviously I only do a weekly show. So that's like 50 guests a year and I can't invite everybody on. But when you wrote to me, there was a hook, you know, obviously Buffalo Wings I'm excited about. But you also tied that into, hey, you know, we do tours for civil rights. This is also, I'd like to share the story about running a tour in a smaller market rather than the larger markets we featured in the past. So you got me in with that hook. I said, oh, this will be really interesting because, you know, I love Buffalo Wings, but also connected with civil rights, et cetera. It's a good tip when our listeners do want to get some kind of press or publicity you know, what's going to interest that writer? Because most journalists you write to, they have a ton of press release that gets sent into them. They're overworked, underpaid. But if you give them that hook, there's a chance they'll be interested in your story. So make it interesting is what I would say. For sure, for sure. And that collaborative nature of working with other businesses also leverages and builds partnerships and ties to make us stronger. Absolutely. I noticed on your website that you were using Fair Harbor for your online booking. Yes. How did that come about? Uh, you know, yeah, I just um, researched a couple of the different ticketing providers. They seem to be, you know, the biggest in the game. So, I mean, I think when I first started, I was doing Eventbrite and that was like super limited. Didn't integrate at all. Yeah, I didn't find that to be super useful, but I think I looked at Peak Pro and Fair Harbor and they were the bigger ones. So I figured <laughs> more, <laughs> yeah, I just figured it was the logical choice, but yeah, I guess I've been pretty happy with it overall. I think the customer service is definitely like their strong suit. They right. always get back like within 24 hours, it seems like, to anything that we have. I guess they don't have like too many complaints about it. Okay, cool. Are you working with any of the OTAs? Yeah, yeah. We're on TripAdvisor. That's been big for us. Although most bookings actually just come through our website. Great. Congratulations. That's that's good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Airbnb, we tried listing on there. That was like really frustrating just because like it doesn't integrate with anything. And yes. It's proprietary. And then we were listed on Get Your Guide. I've never sold a ticket through there. <laughs> However, I will say that their team has been really interested. Like right before COVID, they were interested in coming to Buffalo, largely because of Buffalo Bike Tours, to develop perhaps Buffalo as a destination. We're only 20 miles down the road from Niagara Falls. Yes. And it's definitely like on the circuit to go like people who are going from New York city to Niagara falls often stop in Buffalo. That might be an area that comes about or of more prominence in the near future. Yeah, I feel, and I don't have any inside intelligence on this, but I do feel in 2021 that these bigger OTAs will start spending money on local marketing. So maybe in the past, you know, get your guide very strong in Europe, strong in New York city, San Francisco, not strong in Vermont, not strong in Buffalo, because they've never invested in it, right? Whereas now, if of course, this all depends on the vaccine and everything, but the predictions are people are going to be traveling locally a lot more and doing more local things. I think the OTAs are going to need to invest in those Google AdWords for those local kind of secondary cities and destinations than they have been in the past. As I say, this is just a prediction. I don't have any data to back that up, just a feeling. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Smaller markets for sure. Yeah. That's been interesting too. Just like coming from Portland, a bigger city back to Buffalo. When I moved back, you know, it was kind of incredible to see just people. Yeah. Embrace it. We were the only people to be doing bike tours. 
people are just, you know, jazz that there's, you know, another thing going on in Buffalo. It's a great time to be back in Buffalo. As I said, kind of the revitalization things are like, we've just stopped losing population yeah. <laughs> since like we've been losing population since basically like 1950. And that's just begun to level out and even like do an uptick in certain areas. So there's definitely new energy in the last 10 years. And a lot of that's based around our water. Yeah, there's like little pockets of growth in a lot of different areas. And it's definitely up and coming. Excellent. I want to talk about the three topics that you want to share in terms of how you grew your business. First tip really was to choose your structure carefully. What did you mean by that exactly? Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned I had previously founded a tour operator, tour company in Portland, Oregon, called Know Your City. And I was an executive director there for about seven years. I don't necessarily have any super regrets about it, but it was definitely a learning experience. I founded it as a nonprofit organization. That's a model that you can see in different cities across the states. In fact, there's two nonprofit operators just here in Buffalo alone. You know, good reasons to become a nonprofit. So over the course of those seven years, we wrote and were awarded like 30 different grants from local and state and regional agencies. And we also were able to get those tax deductible donations. That's why you want to become a 501c3. But you're also governed by this board of directors and it just creates like a lot of tensions that every single nonprofit organization is faced with this from the smallest organization to the largest ones. These volunteers who are on the board are making really high level decisions that are essential to kind of the governance of the structure. It's just a really hard way to do business. And after seven years of leadership kind of had a difference with the board in terms of like the vision and where we wanted to go. And I wound up leaving the organization and honestly, it was a really hard time in my life. I took on catering jobs, I was temping, and I was faced with the increasing rents that are just becoming a reality in the Pacific Northwest. I was literally like, know about this like tiny house movement that's mm -hmm. happening in various cities, but I was living in basically like a garage paying like $650 for my rent with no running water, <laughs> trying to just like make it by. And you know, if you're in a creative industry, like a tour operator, it, it was becoming increasingly hard. There was nothing left at the end of the month to, to get ahead and to go on to the next thing. So after a year or so of that, and I tried things up in Seattle briefly, I came back to Buffalo and in Buffalo, you can buy a house, you know, average house here in Buffalo is $100,000, which is like a quarter of what it is in Portland. So just able to have a much higher quality of life here and circle back to that you know, when I was founding Buffalo Bike Tours, I thought about partnership model as well. Like I wanted to do a for-profit, but you're kind of tempted. I don't know how to do everything. I'm good at these particular things, but I need help in these particular areas. So it could be tempting to be like, I want to like partner together with somebody. And, but you have to be really careful about choosing that structure, you know, being really clear about, you know, who's going to be doing what, you know, seeking the legal advice, creating an MOU. It could be really tricky. So I just decided when I did Buffalo Bike Tours, even if I didn't know how to do everything, I was going to learn how to do it and just do everything myself and be an LLC. It's just a lot easier. It's simpler. And I'm able to kind of like control my own destiny because it was a very hard lesson to like found a nonprofit organization, work at it tirelessly for seven years, and then ultimately to kind of lose the vision and ownership of it. What are some of the benefits of an LLC? you know, do whatever you want, <laughs> essentially not have to, you know, answer to a board of directors, make your best judgments and kind of like shoot from the hip a little bit more. You're kind of like gummed up in the, some decision-making process as a nonprofit organization because you have to like seek approval from the board of directors and a lot of these like higher level things and it could lead to some tensions and some difficult choices. So yeah, I'm not saying, you know, it could be a useful structure for certain operators and certainly think about it, but when I had that experience in Portland, starting again in Buffalo, that was a lesson learned. And for me personally, my skills and abilities thought that an LLC was the right choice. Sure. The third learning you wanted to share with us was to be open and responsive in your programming. Could you enlarge on that for us? Yeah, yeah. I guess I kind of alluded to that earlier, but kind of went to these lengths to find the young family. I didn't necessarily have, I just wanted to interview the family and find out more about his story. And in that process of those conversations, I just said, you know, how can I help? How can I help tell this story? How can I help you get the word out about what would you like to see? And that's where the idea to reimagine John Young's recipe and have his wing on our tour 
that's where that came from. That's where this idea of creating a John Young mural came from. It wasn't like I came in with this idea and said, oh, I want to do this. You know, I have a great idea. What do you think of this? <laughs> I think it's really important to build trust to start with like a very small, I'm a white guy who lived in Portland for a while and came back to Buffalo recently. And this is a story that largely, you know, here's a black prominent business owner who had a prominent chicken wing shop three years prior to this Italian couple making chicken wings popular. So I guess one wanted to be mindful of that. And I guess I just wanted to be open to kind of where those conversations went. And that's the same approach that I tried to take when building my other tours, just being open and seeing how we can best be an ally to community-based organizations here in town. Sure. And you were saying uh, earlier on in our conversation that some of the places you stop off at on the wing tour in particular are dive bars and not kind of formal restaurants. So Talk us through what it was like when you pitched up there to say, hey, do you want to be part of my tour? What was the reaction like? Yeah, people never heard of that. I just said we were the first people to do bike tours in the city. We were also the first people really to do food tours in the city. People were not familiar with this concept. We are a smaller community here in Buffalo. People look like I was like from another planet. And um, yeah, <laughs> especially you're going into like some seedy bar, you know, and it's like, yeah, I want to like bring people here to like, sample your chicken wings. <laughs> it's kind of like the opposite of some of like, you know, the high end, like we're going to sample this gourmet food. We tried a lot of places. Some of them stuck. Most of them didn't. <laughs> and the ones that were stuck, had, you know, were really interested in what we were doing. And those are the relationships that we have to this day. So yeah, you know, sometimes you just got to put yourself out there, put yourself in an uncomfortable position. Your third tip, self-care and self-preservation is important. How are you caring for yourself? How are you preserving yourself? How are you protecting your mental health? How are you coping? Oh my God, that's a good question. Yeah, I just think like all things in balance. I think when I was in Portland trying to do this nonprofit, you know, there were certain times, certain months where I was just kind of like scraping by, you know, trying to live this creative life and compromising some quality of life issues, honestly. You know, coming back to Buffalo was a big part of that, lowering my overall expenses, but I'm just honestly, like I have a day job that's not the most exciting or glamorous thing, selling computers, refurbished computers, but it is good work and it provides me with like the stability that I need to pursue this passion project. And eventually, hopefully that will become my full-time endeavor and creative, you know, pursuit. But in the meantime, you know, having that job is like actually really important to just me keeping sane and having the financial stability to do things like, hey, I'm going to spend a couple hundred dollars on, you know, making these rack cards or, you know, doing this advertising. I don't have to like worry about being so hand to mouth. We have a lot of listeners who write to me who made the same decision. They've gone back to work. Yeah. Especially during this time of yeah. COVID, right? Absolutely. You can't just keep flogging and trying if it's not working. Yeah, absolutely. So we have listeners who've done that. We have other listeners who basically said, if it wasn't for my spouse, you know, I couldn't run the business. And of course that brings a lot of pressure at home as well. And, you know, one of my frustrations, social media is a great tool, but sadly most of us just post the highlight reel. No one is talking about that discussion with their spouse who's bringing in, you know, all the income and their partner is not and all the pressure that brings with it. Or, you know, I have one of our listeners who's stacking shelves right now in a supermarket, not exactly happy with his lot in life right now, but knows that, hey, I have to do this until we have the vaccine or local regulations change. I can get back to taking my tours again. And I take my hat off to everyone who's out there working, you know, because the one thing I have learned since starting Torpreneur is we build our businesses not to become multimillionaires, but to make a living and share a passion. So many people in the world are not that lucky to be able to work in a job that is their passion. Absolutely. That certainly resonates with me. Yeah. It resonates with nearly every single tour operator that, that I speak to. And that's why, you know, someone I know is out stacking shelves, for instance, is because, of, yeah, I just need to keep some money coming in so that I'm ready when things open up again to lead my business or, you know, making those big decisions. Hey, I, you know, like Peter Syme, for instance, who's a regular listener to the show, he had to close his international business down because he knew nobody could fly or were going to fly focused on his local. And his passion is definitely is international business but these are the decisions that we have to make otherwise 
Honestly, every industry is kind of going through that right now. I mean, the place that I work at and my day job is going through that. My job has changed like six different times over the course of the last year, literally like my job description. But I think everyone's learning, you know, the big words I think this year are fluid and flexible. And what's the other one? Pivot. Um, pivot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. The more that you can do that, the more that you're going to set yourself up for success. Like just these self-guided tours and that has been huge. And, and hopefully, you know, when things, I believe that things, you know, a year from now will look a lot different and that's going to set us up for success when things do open up. But you have flagged up a really important point here that sometimes we think it is just us. We think, yeah, poor tour travel industry, it's a bad way. But everyone's having their own battles. This morning, I spoke to a guy who runs a gym here in Vermont. I mean, he hasn't had his doors open since March. I don't know how he's coping. Another friend of mine I spoke to over the weekend, you know, he lives in Hollywood. He works in movies while they ain't getting made. So he's basically been out of work for seven or eight months. And that's why you're right to flag this up to everybody. Well, most people are affected by this going through our own battles, but it's how we come through it. And, you know, that the whole self-care part of this is so important. And there's no magic answers. And we're all different as well. We're all white. Some people will go out for a run every day and that clears their mind. And for other people, it's volunteering at a food bank, doing something else. I mean, we just have to find ways of getting through this awful period of time. I don't want to end this on that note, but it's important to be real, isn't it? We're all having our battles and I'm fed up of seeing highlight reels on social media. I get it. I know why we do it. But, you know, for every good story someone's sharing or a good photo, we know there's a lot going on that we don't talk about on social media. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's tough decisions to make. Uh, I guess on a little bit more optimistic note, I'll try to bring it back to yeah. the sunny side of life. I'll say one of the things I just wanted to kind of like throw out there or to address if I was on your show is one of the concepts that I, I try to impart in my tours that I kind of alluded to before, but is the notion of uh, reading the landscape. And that's kind of like what we can infer from our physical spaces. And I kind of view my role as tour guide as an interpreter of history. And we're living at a kind of critical moment during the last you know year with the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests. and. We're in a, for years, history museums have struggled with attendance. No one would go through their doors, but actually I believe in the last year, it kind of shows us that people actually really do care about history. They care about what is in our physical spaces and this whole you know conversation about Confederate statues and that I think is really important. I think we have a responsibility as tour operators to tell authentic stories and to ask hard questions and that's what motivates me. That's what uh, drives me to continue doing the tours and to continue to develop content, even during this time when there's no one coming to Buffalo. <laughs> um, you know, it's really important for us to have those conversations and to not just point out like, here's the mansions of Buffalo, but these mansions were actually built on the backs of our working class people who often sacrificed their lives so that we, you know, have this city today. So those are some of the things that kind of like motivate me and keep me, I guess, centered and and keep me going. I honestly find, I think people are ready to engage with. And what I kind of seek out personally, when I go to a different city, I'm looking at all the different tours. I'm looking for kind of those underground stories that, you know, tell a counter narrative is oftentimes a little bit more interesting or uh, under the radar. Yeah, I love that. I love the underground stories element. And also on a more base level, if I'm driving to Niagara from Vermont. I'm stopping in Buffalo. I haven't got time to kind of find out where the best wings are. I'm going to go on your tour because you're going to take me to them. I always have this fear that I would come to Buffalo or wherever. And then someone say, oh, did you try Joe's? I'd be like, no, oh, they're the best in town. I'd be like, crikey, I missed out on those. So, you know, that's the other thing. It's like the underground stories are important, but also you're the guide. And what I think is successful for tour businesses, what we all want is that behind the scenes, locals, insiders, guide and tour of a city or a destination rather than, hey, this is just what the tourists see. Absolutely. Well, if you're ever in Buffalo, Shane, when this passes, I would love to have you on one of our wing tours or one of our other history tours. And um, you're doing a great job with Tourpreneur. I think it's a fantastic resource. And it's honestly connected me with a lot of different ideas and especially, yeah, in this trying time. Thank you. I will definitely be there because I still have not been to Niagara. So I will be taking that car journey at some point and I'll be stopping off in Buffalo so that we can go and have these wings. All right. Sounds good. Well, uh, hey, carry on. And uh, thank you again for having me on the show. Fantastic. Where can people find your tours online? 
Oh, you can go to buffalobiketours.com and find us there. Or we are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all that other good stuff. Fantastic. Mark, happy new year to you and uh, wishing you a prosperous 2021. You as well. Thank you, Shane. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.